Welcome to the Combat Learning Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Josh Peacock, fourth Don Black Belt in Taekwondo and a martial arts skill training specialist. If you're new to the show, please sign up to the Combat Learning Newsletter at combatlearning.com slash newsletter. I'll send you cheat sheets on how to transform your drills into maximum skill building games and get you up to speed on the science of motor skill learning for martial arts. Plus, you'll never miss a show. Go to combatlearning.com slash newsletter to get those resources now. Today, I'm joined by Emil Fitusi, a professional Muay Thai coach out of Naka Dojo in Sweden. Over the past year, Emil has transitioned his partially ecological Muay Thai program into a 100% ecological program. In this episode, he recounts his journey into the ecological dynamics and constraints-led approaches. Then, we talk about how he builds the culture of his Muay Thai program to value the safety of sparring partners. Finally, we discuss several interesting practical topics, including using external focus of attention to help learners self-organize striking techniques, how his use of tie pads has changed and how he uses them now, how he's changed his warm-up from calisthenics-based to based on mini games, and one of the ways that he helps day one brand new students control power output for safe sparring games. There's been a content desert for how to use the ecological approach to striking. Today, I'm happy to provide you with a substantial entry into what I hope will become a burgeoning community of coaches who collaborate on how to make this work for striking sports. I had incredible fun recording this series of episodes with Emil, and I'm extremely impressed with him and what he's done. He's a smart guy, but he's still a regular Muay Thai coach like most of you, and makes me confident that most striking coaches can use CLA for their programs too. If you get value out of this episode, consider buying me a coffee at combatlearning.com slash support. Think of it like a tip. It supports the show, and I truly appreciate it. Now, if you're excited to jump in, hit the subscribe button on your podcatcher and enjoy the show. Oh, all right, man. Welcome to the Combat Learning Podcast. Go ahead and uh, introduce us, your name, and give us your background in martial arts. Hello, my name is Emil Fitusi. I am one of the head coaches at Nakadoyo in the Naka municipality here in Stockholm County in Sweden. Uh, and I teach uh, Muay Thai to both beginners and a select few who compete in Muay Thai. And mm. since January, I've been using a lot of ecological approach to uh, skill development. And since I would say around July, I've been 100% utilizing ecological dynamics to design my practices and the way I work with both competitors and beginners. I started with Muay Thai at around 15 and Mm -hmm. uh, at 18, I was uh, made uh, the coach for the kids program at the club Mm -hmm. I taught and I'm turning 30 next year. So it's almost 12 years now as a coach, Uh, but I've been at Nakadoyo since 2020 since the pandemic hit essentially and we had to kind of rebuild our our program our muay thai program so me and one of my best friends we took care of that and we've been very successful so far and it's been very successful utilizing a lot of the ecological ecological dynamics uh, in the terms of structuring the classes yeah very exciting that is cool so how did you get interested in ecological dynamics like how did you even discover it so I think very early on when I was doing Muay Thai, when I still was an active uh, competitor and had the hopes of competing, I always felt like the way we trained was a little bit wrong. We usually did a lot of pads. We usually did sparring. But I, I, I could tell something was missing because usually we we drilled uh, and we sparred in a certain way. And when we fought, it looked completely different. So I was always a little bit skeptical Uh, of the way we were trading Uh, Mm -hmm. and I also come from a footballing background or a soccer background where it was really important that you played a lot of games where where you had to kind of practice the moments of the game Uh, the the smaller picture became the bigger picture when it was game day Uh, so I was 
early on, I was very skeptical of the way training was structured. And when I went back to high school and when I was around 23 or something, I really started to delve into pedagogy and psychology and sports science. And I started realizing, actually, the first thing I realized was how stupid our warm-ups usually were. They're <laughs> running, around, running around in circles, doing jumping yeah. jacks and push-ups because the, the body gets warm if you move it. It doesn't really matter how you move it because the body mm -hmm. can't separate what we are doing. It's not a thinking being if you want to mm -hmm. look at it that way. So uh, I always felt like, well, we can do warm-ups better. We can do our, our strength and conditioning better. We can do uh, our practice better. There's got to be something here. So I was playing around a lot with that, and it kind of cumul cumulated in my, uh, I don't know what the equivalent is in America, but in Sweden you do a basically high school paper to get your diploma. It's a, it's a big job you do. And oh, my, like a thesis or something like that? Or yeah, 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 yeah. Like a... Like a test thesis to show mm -hmm. that you are ready for university. And my paper was named uh, Teaching Youths Defensive Thai Boxing Utilizing Self-Determination Theory. And wow. I actually re read it before I came on here. And there's a lot of ecological stuff in there without me really realizing it. Mm -hmm. Because when I did this paper, it was basically I had to teach these people who or these kids rather who don't know really know anything about Thai boxing and I have to teach them how to deal with punches and kicks and knees and all all this stuff and the only way they can learn this is if someone punches or kicks or knees or throw elbows at them uh, this way of like one two three roll under it doesn't work I've seen it it doesn't work no. so yeah. Yeah, I had to structure training in that way. And uh, later on, when I was, uh, I had a short stint in university, uh, during Christmas break, I was listening to uh, a podcast uh, that was called BJJ Mental Models. And the guest was Greg Souders, uh, <laughs> who's very well known in the ecological uh, the yeah. martial arts community. Uh, and, and when he talked about the ecological approach, it just like, it, I didn't need convincing because uh, everything sounded right with my background in pedagogy and what I know about that stuff. I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, yeah, this this makes perfect sense. So we started playing around with that around last Christmas. And, and uh, then I was like, yeah, this, this works. I see beginners learning stuff when we put them in certain situations without giving them the direct instructions of, hey, you need to do this. You need to do this. Move your feet here. Move your feet here. Instead, mm -hmm. just like put them in a situation, go. And they learned. They started learning so much. And it was incredible to see. So I, I was convinced pretty quickly. And now when I've researched it more, I've read about a lot of books about it. I, I, I'm starting to feel like I'm getting the hang of it. And I, I hope I am. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're, you're feeling the, you're getting that formal knowledge now. Now you're understanding yeah. it in a greater depth. Not just yeah. you started with the practical, it sounds like. Yeah. And now you're, you're kind of filling up some of the formal stuff in the background, which is, I think, a good yeah. way to go. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. The self determination theory is interesting. A lot of people, they either get interested in that at the same time they get interested in ecological approach or it's uh, one of the pathways towards that, it seems like. I've heard some other people, they kind of got into motivation first, they didn't really know where they were going. They're just looking no. for something different. Yeah. And the motivation, obviously, is a really important part of stay, like staying in training, okay. but also obviously. how 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 well you progress as yeah. during that time. So, yeah. yeah, really interesting. Yeah. Now I was doing a, in yeah, yeah, yeah. High school, I was basically studying a course that was also supposed to teach you how to be a personal trainer. So mm -hmm. being building motivation with your clients was really important. So we spend a lot of time in that field. And then I started reading more uh, towards the the kid side of things and upbringing and how, how children learn. And, and a lot of it comes down to just playing and, and interacting with society in different ways. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it made a sense of of how to build motivation that was basically where i began so when we start having this uh, this approach that preaches freedom well i was just like yeah this i'm on board let's play <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely children they like to 
like role play with among children, you should never yeah, stifle yeah. role play because no. they're trying things on and seeing, yeah. you know, how it feels, how it fits. Um, yeah. and so, I mean, there's obviously kids will cross the line on some things, but for the most part, you should let them, let them role play because that's how yeah. they navigate how they fit into the world. I, my sister recently had a son and it's so amazing watching him figure the world out and it's it's he hasn't started speaking yet uh, but I like the creativity and how he views the world is amazing yes yeah if you have <laughs> eyes for it, it watching yeah. watching a child grow up yeah. and unspeak in progressive levels start to understand and relate with the world yeah. it is truly fascinating and, and wonderful it's absolutely amazing so what was your journey into changing your program? How did you start to apply the ecological approach to how you trained? So, like I said, last Christmas was the first time I really kind of knew what I wanted to do, uh, mm -hmm. utilizing an ecological approach. So at that time, we had already decided that before that during Christmas, we were going to focus a lot on clinching. Uh, that was the uh, objective. And at the time, I've already also started grappling a bit, doing a bit of jiu-jitsu with a friend, uh, which was mostly just sparring. <laughs> so mm -hmm. when when I heard uh, Greg talk about uh, grappling in an ecological approach, I, I started listening and started thinking to myself, well, how can I apply this? And he's talked about uh, beginning with the end goal in mind which I thought was a really clever way of like, instead of running the marathon, start at the finish line so you don't have to run the unnecessary steps. Yeah. So basically what we did was, uh, I, I'm i going off memory here, but I think I started them, I told them we have three positions. We have the body lock, we have the tie plum, and we have, we call it a neck breaker position. Uh, I don't really know. It's kind of like you're putting your head towards someone's head and, mm -hmm. and, and grabbing it at the same time. And I basically told people, you can choose which of these positions you want to start in. Mm -hmm. One person's job is to land as many knees and hold this position as long as possible. The other person needs to break free. And basically that's was it. And it was really fun because obviously the advanced people, they applied a lot of techniques and a lot of strategy to it. But the beginners also, because it became natural. The only way really to solve it was to, to push away on the face or start twisting arms or start mm -hmm. digging under hooks without me having to explain them. Even if someone asked like, hey, uh, how do I, what are we supposed to do? It's like, oh, well, he is keeping this lock and he's locking you very tight. You need to get out. And they could self-organize around that task. So it yeah. was really amazing to see that. Yeah. And then we just moved it back a little bit. So we, maybe we started with like, hey, okay, now we are starting from one position. You need to get to this position and same goal and goal in mind. And the same thing for the other person, break free. And 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 from there we could build on practice. And I we we tried to teach clinch a lot. I think the level of clinching in Sweden is fairly low if you compare it to like a professional standard. Mm -hmm. And it's always this talk of like, oh well, when we are here, we need to push here or we need to twist here. And it never really works it, it, people become really poor at clinching and the only time i've seen people become good at clinching is when they clinch a lot <laughs> they yeah. basically just play around with it mm -hmm. so this was kind of an approach and where i started seeing like damn they are it actually looks like clinching people are actually working towards something and working in a very good way which is even more important for me real quick before i put you back into the podcast Want to take your knowledge and practice of the ecological or constraints-led approach to the next level? Go to combatlearning.com slash waitlist to join the waiting list for our combat learning workshops. You'll have direct access to me to work through the problems you're experiencing on your mat or bounce off ideas, and you'll collaborate with other coaches who are working through the same problems. The waiting list for the second cohort of my combat learning workshops is now open. The first cohort filled up quick, there might be a one or two spots still open if they don't reply, but this one likely will fill up too. Don't wait because there might not be a third cohort and there definitely won't be a fourth. Go to combatlearning.com slash waitlist, W-A-I-T-L-A-I-S-T to ensure you get to the next cohort. Yeah. 
Absolutely. That's an, that would be an example, I think, of interacting constraints because you have, yeah. you have the personal constraint. What are you working with with your own body? And then yeah. you have your environment, which is really your opponent. And then the task and the task, all of these things sort of limit what can be done. And so when yeah. you're exploring that space, there's only so many things you can actually do to get what you want. Yeah. And people, I think they come, Muay well, Thai is complex, but people make it more complex than it actually is, right? Yep. In jujitsu, even worse. <laughs> yeah. Right? The jujitsu people, they pride themselves. They're, they're quite snobbish about striking, actually. They say that, uh, that striking is not, is simpler than, yeah. um, than grappling, which I don't agree with. You just don't mm. see the complexity. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think as, I think as much as you do with entangled limbs, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's an amazing sport because uh, in in kickboxing you look at one of the best of all time, and Ernesto Hust, and he has lost twice to a guy who played NFL his whole life in Bob Sapp. And I don't think you can find that example in like grappling or other sports because striking can be so incredibly chaotic that you almost have mm -hmm. to be you basically have to be perfect. Mm -hmm. You you can't be hit once because it can be over, and that's yeah. uh, pretty incredible striking. So I like grappling too a lot. I, I grappled yeah. a lot this year, but striking is also this kind of beautiful chaos. <laughs> yeah, I've been rekindling because my background has been you know taekwondo, karate, and kickboxing, and yeah. um, I've done jujitsu the la on and off the last ten years, and I've really enjoyed that too. But I'm like feeling that itch to go kickbox again because. <laughs> Because from a constraints led approach, from an ecological approach, I'm I'm seeing different things that that has rekindled my interest in it. It's just so fascinating yeah. Yeah. how much you have to manipulate space, distance, yeah. angle, yeah. yeah, just to tag, you know, just yeah. to hit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I I also felt a, a lot of love, if you want to use that word, come back for the sport. Uh, we had a session yesterday, a beginner session, and it was like easily like a top three beginning session I've ever done. And just the, <laughs> the love you feel from that is incredible. Like I've mm. been having like a smile on my face, like since yesterday evening because yeah. of that, because you saw a skill and relevant skill emerge and it's just, oh, it's the best feeling when you're coaching. Yeah, that's the coach. That's the coach's heart, man. Yeah, <laughs> you, you get you get excited for your brand new students. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like these guys are. Oh man, these guys are already doing what they're supposed to do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's a lot of. It's 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 almost like being a parent. It's a strange. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I've, I've, yeah. I'm not a parent yet, but I know there's a, there's an immense amount of pride when you become a parent yeah. and watching your child grow up. Uh, and yeah. it's, it is, it's kind of like that. It's the only analogy that I can think of when you're a coach and you see these people under your tutelage, just get it. Yeah. I spoke with one of my friends who's a coach, uh, last year and he was talking about his, his coaching journey. And he, he told me like, oh, I decided just be, I was just going to do this like as a job. I was only going to come in, uh, do my job, collect my paycheck and then leave, but I can't. <laughs> because that's not coaching. I have to be this deeply involved and it has to suck sometime. I have to be really sad when it doesn't go our way and I have to be mm -hmm. very happy when it does go our way. But you can't, you have to care. If you don't care, you're in the wrong job. Yeah. It's a, it's the people that coaching is a people business. If you think it's yeah. that you're going to be an engineer and you're going to work on machines and that's how yeah. it's, you're not going to be a good coach. No, it doesn't work not that at way. All. No, it's not. It's not the uh, programming. It's it's it's, com it's com super complex. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So speaking of beginners, yeah. how do you how do you manage a day one beginner? How do how do you start them in a way that's there's genuine interaction, but it is safe for them. So usually uh, at the start i try to work in terms of semester so i try to plan a uh, out how a semester is going to go uh, and always start with telling people like hey these are the rules this is how we do things you have to set that kind of culture uh, i think very mm -hmm. early and you have to be very strict with it so i think this year i i told them that we have free non-negotiable rules. We have, you have to work hard. Uh, you have to show respect for others and you have to show respect for yourself. 
so if someone says stop or it hurts, uh, then it turns into assault if you continue and then you're getting thrown out of the gym and we're not gonna, even going to debate it. It's not going to be uh, questions asked. It's just mm. going to happen. So don't do it. And the people oftentimes listen to that. They, they, they respect that. So I think if you set that culture early of, hey, we're working to get better at something. We're not here to, to fight. We're here to actually learn sport. Uh, beginners usually feel a lot safe, safer uh, when trying martial arts. But also you have to be in, keep it in mind that like what we're doing is basically going against our evolution. We don't want to fight. So mm -hmm. it can be scary. And, and I think it's really important to acknowledge those feelings for people and, and, and talk about them. So if we're, for example, working a defensive drill where punches are coming our way, you can talk about it like, hey, this is scary, but now we need to be a little bit brave. We need to be a little bit courageous. And, and we need to, if we are having that feeling of fear, well, that's a perfect opportunity to show a bit of courage because if we didn't feel fear, we wouldn't be courageous. We would just not feel anything. Mm -hmm. So acknowledging those, uh, the anxiety of it is a big part of it and setting those cultural standards, I think are, are the most important things when you're dealing with complete beginners who maybe haven't, haven't thrown a punch in their life or, or haven't been punched at all. So that's yeah. really important to me. Cool. That is really important. So what, what are the methods look like? How do you start them with learning how to punch, how to move, how to kick? So, uh, this year was actually really funny because, uh, I always felt, uh, that, uh, we have, we have taken, a, oftentimes, uh, I think I looked at last semester's schedule and I think we did six weeks of like, technique training where it basically was like, oh, first day we're going to go over straight punches and kicks uh, and second class we're going to go over uh, front kicks and then we're going to do switch kick and we're going to talk about all these different tools that we're going to put in the toolbox so you can then start utilizing them in sparring and sparring like situations and this year I basically said like okay let's use these first two weeks to kind of get people uh, a little bit to join the gym and feel comfortable so we don't just throw them and say hey let's uh, let's fight but in, rather like hey come in and this is kind of what it looks like this is kind of what it looks like when you look on Instagram or you look at a you look on the YouTube or whatever um but already week 3 we're going to go uh, we're going to go live and we're going to be sparring essentially Mm. So the first week, uh, we have these beautiful pads that have a big circle on them. I basically told them, okay, there's a couple of ways to hold the pad. You can hold it straight. You can hold it sideways. You can hold it uh, facing downwards. And our only job is to connect our front three knuckles through this uh, circle on the pad. And fairly uh. quickly, people, you know, there's... When you explain it that way, there is no other way than to throw straight hook uppercuts and organize round then. And then, of course, beginners hold the pads a little bit how they want because they are not used to it. So it basically becomes a game of like throwing punches in different ways. Uh, but last session, as I mentioned, we had a lot of beginners where we went completely live and a lot of them organized around that task where you tell them like, hey, we're going to throw punches at each other. And people have an, a kind of an idea of what a punch looks like. They've probably seen a movie or they've seen it in a, mm -hmm. seen a match or something. So they they were able to organize. So I think next semester, we're probably not even going to have that introductory weeks. We're just going to go right into it because it had such a great effect on it. Yeah, absolutely. So how fast do you project them you said they got three live they got fully live and week three yeah is that when so, you start interacting more of like the medium slices game sort of games or are they doing just doing full sparring uh no so uh as i said i fought warm-ups the running around in circles jump yeah i thought it was trash pretty mm -hmm. much <laughs> very early on yeah. So what we have done a lot is play games for warm-ups so mm -hmm. what we've done uh, as a consistent theme this uh, year has been we start with a game of shoulder tag we start with a game of nice. toe tag 
where we bas basically try to step on each other's toes uh, gently. And we also played a game <laughs> I used to call I used to call it Kusushi, where basically you lift one leg up in the air and you try to get your partner to put the leg down in the air or, yes. or put the leg down on the ground. If you put both feet down well, you have to basically basically do a burp. You have to lay down and you have to get back up to kind of simulate that. Hey, you got knocked down. Get back mm. up. Let's fight again. Uh, so having them play those types of games, uh, we've also done a game where I'm standing in front of you and your job is to keep me in front of you, but I have to get to your back basically to help people understand that, hey, you can create angles when you're fighting and then telling them when we're actually doing these games. Hey, keep the warm up in mind. We were very good there. We were quick in, we were quick out, we were moving our feet, we were getting these uh, beautiful positions. So keep this in mind when you're doing like, the tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to the more sparring part of the sessions, we've basically done, so we, we did a lot of defensive work last uh, or, or two weeks ago. And then it was basically explaining like, hey, we're gonna be moving our feet. And the other person is going to throw punches at our face. Uh, if the person you're throwing at is closing their eyes rapidly or flinching, you're going too hard. And uh, of course, they're beginners, so they're not used to something coming at them. So they're going to flinch at even if you like go very slowly. Yeah. And they kind of set that, uh, I guess, God, that constraint among themselves mm -hmm. uh, in the group and within that relationship that the two people have built. Um, and they get to self-organize around that and, and, and move around. And then we added like, hey, now you can use your hands. Try to push the punches away. Basically adding that difficulty for the person who's throwing the punches that have to organize around someone actually blocking punches, but also helping the other person. Okay, you're still moving your feet, but now you can use your hands. Okay, now you can use your forearms. Now you can use your shoulders as well. Now you have this functioning guard of everything working together. And you're creating a person who has to work on offense and you're creating a person who has to work on defense. If you think of it uh, in all terms of offense and defense, uh, mm -hmm. if you, if that's your philosophy, it's maybe mm -hmm. not mine, but <laughs> interesting. <laughs> yeah. So is that, that's, is that one of the ways you control for intensity? Are there any other ways that you help control for intensity and make sure that contact is not excessive during practice? Thanks so much for listening to the combat learning podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. It really helps us out. Finally, this episode, including the intro music, is produced by Micah Peacock. Thanks in advance, and I'll see you on the next episode.